This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Mark Nelson. Plague Ship by Andre Norton. Chapter 3 Contact at Last. What in? Frank Mira, steward, storekeeper, and cook of the Queen, retreated into the nearest cabin doorway as the young Salaric flashed down the ladder into his section. Dane, with the now resigned Sinbad in the crook of his arm, had tailed his guest and arrived just in time to see the native come to an abrupt halt before one of the most important doors in the spacer the portal of the hydro-garden which renewed the ship's oxygen and supplied them with fresh fruit and vegetables to vary their diet of concentrates. The Salaric laid one hand on the smooth surface of the sealed compartment and looked back over his shoulder at Dane with an inquiry to which was added something of a plea. Guided by his instinct, that this was important to them all, Dane spoke to Mira. Can you let him in there, Frank? It was not sensible. It might even be dangerous. But every member of the crew knew the necessity for making some sort of contact with the natives. Mira did not even nod, but squeezed by the Salaric and pressed the lock. There was a sign of air, the crisp smell of growing things, lacking the languorous perfumes of the world outside, puffed into the faces. The cub remained where he was, head up, his wide nostrils visibly drinking in that smell. Then he moved with the silent, uncanny speed which was the heritage of his race, darting down the narrow aisle toward a mass of greenery at the far end. Sinbad kicked and growled. This was his private hunting ground, the preserve he kept free of invaders. Dane put the cat down. The Salaric had found what he was seeking. He stood on tiptoe to sniff at a plant, his yellow eyes half-closed, his whole stance spelling ecstasy. Dane looked to the steward for enlightenment. What's he so interested in, Frank? Catnip. Catnip? Dane repeated. The word meant nothing to him but Mura had a habit of picking up strange plants and cultivating them for study. What is it? One of the Terran mints, an herb. Mira gave a short explanation as he moved down the aisle toward the alien. He broke off a leaf and crushed it between his fingers. Dane, his sense of smell largely deadened by the pungency with which he had been surrounded by most of that day, could distinguish no new odor but the young Celeric swung around to face the steward, his eyes wide, his nose questing. And Sinbad gave a whining yowl and made a spring to push his head against the steward's now aromatic hand. So, now they had it, an opening wedge. Dane came up to the three. All right to take a leaf or two? he asked Mira. Why not? I grow it for Sinbad. To a cat it is like hemel smoke or a tankard of lacabod. And by Sinbad's actions, Dane guessed that the plant did hold for the cat the same attraction those stimulants produced in human beings. He carefully broke off a small stem supporting three leaves and presented it to the Salaric, who stared at him and then, snatching the twig, raced from the hydro garden as if pursued by feuding clansmen. Dane heard the pad of his feet on the ladder. Apparently the cub was making sure of escape with his precious find. But the cargo master apprentice was frowning. As far as he could see, there were only five of the plants. "'That's all the catnip you have?' Mira tucked Sinbad under his arm and shooed Dane before him out of the hydro. "'There was no need to grow more.' 
A small portion of the herb goes a long way with this one. He put the cat down in the corridor. The leaves may be preserved by drying. I believe that there is a small box of them in the galley. A strictly limited supply. Suppose this was the key which would unlock the Koros trade. And yet it was to be summed up in five plants and a few dried leaves. However, Van Ryck must know of this as soon as possible. But to Dane's growing discomfiture, the cargo master showed no elation as his junior poured out the particulars of his discovery. Instead, there were definite signs of displeasure to be read by those who knew Van Ryck well. He heard Dane out and then got to his feet. Tolling the younger man with him by a crooked finger, he went out of his combined office living quarters to the domain of medic Craig Tau. Problem for you, Craig. Van Ryck seated his bulk on the wall jump seat Tau pulled down for him. Dane was left standing just within the door, very sure now that instead of being commended for his discovery of a few minutes before, he was about to suffer some reprimand. And the reason for it still eluded him. What do you know about that plant Mira grows in the hydro, the one called catnip? Tau did not appear surprised at that demand. The medic of a free trading spacer was never surprised at anything. He had his surfeit of shocks during his first years of service, and after that accepted any occurrence, no matter how weird, as matter of fact. In addition, Tao's hobby was magic, the hidden knowledge possessed and used by witch-doctors and medicine men on alien worlds. He had a library of recordings, odd scraps of information, of certified results of certain very peculiar experiments. Now and then he wrote a report, which was sent into central service, read with raised eyebrows by perhaps half a dozen incredulous desk-warmers, and filed away to be safely forgotten. But even that had ceased to frustrate him. "'It's an herb of the mint family, from Terra,' he replied. "'Mira grows it for Sinbad. It has quite a marked influence on cats.' Frank's been trying to keep him anchored to the ship by allowing him to roll in fresh leaves. He does it, then continues to sneak out whenever he can. That explains something for Dane, why the Salariki cub wished to enter the Queen tonight. Some of the scent of the plant had clung to Sinbad's fur, had been detected, and the Salarik had wanted to trace it to its source. "'Is it a drug?' Van Ryck prodded. In the way that all herbs are drugs. Human beings have dosed themselves in the past with a tea made of the dried leaves. It has no great medicinal properties. To felines it is a stimulation, and they get the same satisfaction from rolling in and eating the leaves as we do from drinking. The Salariki are, in a manner of speaking, felines, Van Ryck mused. Tau straightened. The Salariki have discovered catnip, I take it. Van Ryck nodded at Dane, and for the second time the cargo master apprentice made his report. When he was done, Van Ryck asked a direct question of the medical officer. What effect would catnip have on a Salarik? It was only then that Dane grasped the enormity of what he had done. They had no way of gauging the influence of an off-world plant on an alien metabolism. What if he had introduced to the natives of Sargol a dangerous drug, started that cub on some path of addiction? He was cold inside. Why, he might even have poisoned the child. Tao picked up his cap, and after a second's hesitation, his emergency medical kit— he had only one question for Dane. Any idea of who the cub is? What clan he belongs to? And Dane, chill with real fear, was forced to answer in the negative. What had he done? Can you find him? Van Ryck, ignoring Dane, spoke to Tao. The medic shrugged. I can try. I was out scouting this morning, met one of the storm priests who handles their medical work, 
But I wasn't welcomed. However, under the circumstances, we have to try something. In the corridor, Van Ryck had an order for Dane. I suggest that you keep to quarters, Thorson, until we know how matters stand. Dane saluted. That note in his superior's voice was like a whiplash, much worse to take than the abuse of a lesser man. He swallowed as he shut himself into his own cramped cubby. This might be the end of their venture. And they would be lucky if their charter was not withdrawn. Let I.S. get an inkling of his rash action, and the company would have them up before the board to be stripped of all their rights in the service. Just because of his own stupidity, his pride in being able to break through where Van Ryck and the captain had faced a stone wall. And, worse than the future which could face the Queen, was the thought that he might have introduced some dangerous drug into Sargal with his gift of those few leaves. When would he learn? He threw himself down on his bunk and despondently pictured the string of calamities which could, and maybe would, stem from his thoughtless and hasty action. Within the Queen, night and day were mechanical. The lighting in the cabins did not vary much. Dane did not know how long he lay there forcing his mind to consider his stupid action making himself face that in the service there were no shortcuts which endangered others, not unless those taking the risks were Terrans. "'Dane!' Rip Shannon's voice cut through his self-imposed nightmare. But he refused to answer. "'Dane! Van wants you on the double!' "'Why? To bring him up before Jellico, probably.' Dane schooled his expression, got up, pulling his tunic straight, still unable to meet Rip's eyes. Shannon was just one of those he had let down so badly. But the other did not notice his mood. "'Wait till you see them. Half Sargal must be here yelling for trade.' That comment was so far from what he had been expecting that Dane was startled out of his gloomy thoughts. Rip's brown face was one wide smile. His black eyes danced. It was plain he was honestly elated. "'Get a move on, fire rockets,' he urged, "'or Van will blast you for fair.' Dane did move, up the ladder to the next level and out on the port ramp. What he saw below brought him up short. Evening had come to Sargal, but the scene immediately below was not in darkness. Blazing torches advanced in lines from the grass forest, and the portable floodlight of the spacer added to the general glare, turning night into noonday. Van Ryck and Jellico sat on stools, facing at least five of the seven major chieftains with whom they had conferred to no purpose earlier. And behind these leaders milled a throng of lesser celeriki. Yes, there was at least one carrying chair, and also a norgal, from the back of which a veiled noblewoman was being assisted to dismount by two retainers. The women of the clans were coming, which could mean only that trade was at last in progress. But trade for what? Dane strode down the ramp. He saw a path his hand carefully covered by his trade cloth, advanced to Van Ryck, whose own fingers were decently veiled by a handkerchief. Under the folds of fabric their hands touched. The bargaining was in the first stages, and it was important enough for the clan leaders to conduct themselves, where, according to Cam's records, it had been usual to delegate that power to a favored liegeman. Catching the light from the ship's beam and from the softer flares of the Salariki torches was a small pile of stones resting on a stool to one side. Dane drew a deep breath. He had heard the Koros stones described, had seen the tridee print of one found among Cam's recordings, but the reality was beyond his expectations. He knew the technical analysis of the gems, that they were, as the amber of Terra, 
the fossilized resin exuded by ancient plants, maybe the ancestors of the grass trees, long buried in the saline deposits of the shallow seas where chemical changes had taken place to produce the wonder jewels. In color they shaded from a rosy apricot to a rich mauve, but in their depths other colors, silver, fiery gold, spun sparks which seemed to move as the gem turned. And, which was what first endeared them to the Salariki, when worn against the skin and warmed by body heat, they gave off a perfume which enchanted not only the Sargolian natives, but all in the galaxy wealthy enough to own one. On another stool placed at Van Rijk's right hand, as that bearing the chorus stones was at Paths, was a transparent plastic box containing some wrinkled brownish leaves. Dane moved as unobtrusively as he could to his proper place at such a trading session, behind Van Rijk. More Salariki were tramping out of the forest, torch-bearing retainers and cloaked warriors. A little to one side was a third party Dane had not seen before. They were clustered about a staff which had been driven into the ground, a staff topped with a white streamer marking a temporary trading ground. These were Salariki right enough, but they did not wear the colorful garb of those about them. Instead, they were all clad alike in muffling, sleeved robes of a drab green, the storm priests, their robes denoting the color of the Sargolian sky just before the onslaught of their worst tempests. Cam had not left many clues concerning the religion of the Salariki, but the storm priests had, in narrowly defined limits, power, and their recognition of the Terran traders would add to good feeling. In the knot of storm priests a Terran stood, Medic Tau, and he was talking earnestly with the leader of the religious party. Dane would have given much to have been free to cross and ask Tau a question or two. Was all this assembly the result of the discovery in the hydro? But even as he asked himself that, the trade cloths were shaken from the hands of the bargainers, and Van Wright gave an order over his shoulder. "'Measure out two spoonfuls of the dried leaves into a box,' he pointed to a tiny plastic container. With painstaking care, Dane followed directions. At the same time, a servant of the Salaric chief swept a handful of gems from the other stool and dropped them in a heap before Van Rijk, who transferred them to a strong box resting between his feet. Paft arose, but he had hardly quitted the trading seat before one of the lesser clan leaders had taken his place, the bargaining cloth ready looped loosely about his wrist. It was at that point that the proceedings were interrupted. A new party came into the open, their utilitarian trade tunics made a drab blot as they threaded their way in a compact group through the throng of the Salariki. I.S. men. So they had not lifted from Sargal. They showed no signs of uneasiness. It was as if their rights were being infringed by the free traders. And Kali, their cargo master, swaggered right to the bargaining point. The chatter of Salariki voices was stilled. The Sargolians withdrew a little, letting one party of Terrans face the other, sensing drama to come. Neither Van Rijk nor Jellicoe spoke. It was left to Callie to state his case. "'You've crooked your orbit this time, bright boys!' His jeer was a pain of triumph. "'Code 3, Article 6, or can't you absorb rules tapes with your thick heads?' Code 3, Article 6. Dane searched his memory for that law of the service. The words flashed into his mind as the auto-learner had planted them during his first year of training back in the pool. To no alien race shall any trader introduce any drug, food, or drink from off-world until such a substance has been certified as non-harmful to the aliens. There it was. I.S. had them, and it was all his fault. But if he had been so wrong, why in the world did Van Rijk sit there trading, condoning the error, and making it into a crime for which they could be summoned before the board and struck off the rolls of the service? Van Rijk smiled gently. 
Code for Article Two. He quoted with the genial air of one playing gift giver at a Forkidian feasting. Code for Article Two. Any organic substance offered for trade must be examined by a committee of trained medical experts, an equal representation of Terrans and aliens. Callie's sneering smile did not vanish. Well, he challenged, where's your board of experts? Tao, Van Wright called to the medic with the storm priests. Will you ask your colleague to be so kind as to allow the cargo master Callie to be presented? The tall, dark, young Terran medic spoke to the priest beside him, and together they came across the clearing. Van Ryck and Jellicoe both arose and inclined their heads in honor to the priests, as did the chief with whom they had been about to deal. "'Reader of clouds and master of many winds,' Tao's voice flowed with the many vowed titles of the Sargalian. "'May I bring before your face Cargo Master Kali, a servant of intersolar in the realm of trade?' The storm-priest's shaven skull and body gleamed steel-gray in the light. His eyes, of that startling blue-green, regarded the I.S. party with cynical detachment. "'You wish of me?' Plainly he was one who believed in getting down to essentials at once. Callie could not be overawed. "'These free traders have introduced among your people a powerful drug which will bring much evil." He spoke slowly in simple words, as if he were addressing a cub. "'You have evidence of such evil?' countered the storm-priest. "'In what manner is this new plant evil?' For a moment Callie was disconcerted, but he rallied quickly. "'It has not been tested.' You do not know how it will affect your people." The storm-priest shook his head impatiently. "'We are not lacking in intelligence, traitor. This plant has been tested, both by your master of life secrets and ours. There is no harm in it. Rather, it is a good thing, to be highly prized, so highly that we shall give thanks that it was brought unto us. This speech together is finished." He pulled the loose folds of his robe closer about him and walked away. Now, Van Ryck addressed the I.S. party, I must ask you to withdraw. Under the rules of trade, your presence here can be actively resented. But Callie had lost little of his assurance. You haven't heard the last of this. A tape of the whole proceedings goes to the board. As you wish. But in the meantime, Van Ryck gestured to the waiting Sadariki, who were beginning to mutter impatiently. Callie glanced around, heard those mutters, and made the only move possible, away from the Queen. He was not quite so cocky, but neither had he surrendered. Dane caught at Tao's sleeve and asked the question which had been burning in him since he had come upon the scene. "'What happened? Uh, about the catnip?' There was a lightning of the serious expression on Tao's face. "'Fortunately for you, that child took the leaves to the storm-priest. They tested and approved it. And I can't see that it has any ill effects. But you were just lucky, Thorson. It might have gone another way." Dane sighed. "'I know that, sir,' he confessed. "'I'm not trying to rock it out.' Tao gave a half-smile. "'We all off-fire our tubes at times,' he conceded. "'Only next time.' He did not need to complete that warning as Dane caught him up. "'There isn't going to be a next time like this, sir. Ever. End of chapter 3